Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's episode, we're going to talk about conductivity curves in titrations. So we're going to start by looking at the concept of conductivity. We're going to think about how we can actually draw or construct a conductivity curve. We're going to look at the idea of conductivity at the equivalence point in a titration. And then we're going to explore the different types of conductivity curves we might see, depending on what type of acid and base we are, um, we are reacting together. So what do we mean by conductivity? So we're thinking about this idea as conductivity is describing the ability of a solution to conduct an electric current. Now there, whether a solution is able to conduct an electric current where the charge can flow depends on a range of different factors. We measure it in units of called millisiemens, which is what that capital S refers to. Millisiemens per square meter per mole. It's just, it bases basically relates to how the different quantities are, are put together to be able to actually measure it, is where those that strange combination of units comes from. But the conductivity of a solution depends on a range of different factors, which we all have to be able to account for, or kind of make sense of, in a solution. So the identity of the ions that are actually able to move um, in that solution, and their charge, you know, do they have well, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, or, or similar um, magnitude of a negative charge, how concentrated are they, how mobile are they, that is based on their mass and their charge, are they able to easily move in that solution, as well as also the temperature of the solution that we're measuring it in, because that will affect the ability of those particles to move around, their kinetic energy, and so it's important that we're, um, we're mindful of that. So conductivity is something about a solution that we can measure that relates to uh, some properties of the ions that are in that solution. But particularly the ones that we're going to be focusing on, or that, that have a, a great bearing on what we do here, is this idea of ion concentration, ion charge, and ion mobility. How mobile and how charged are, are these ions? How conductive are they? And so now we're going to think about, well, how does it actually relate to titrations? We've looked at the idea that we can use titration um, and we can use a range of different techniques to identify when we've reached the equivalence point of a titration. We can use pH monitoring, we can use an old-fashioned kind of qualitative uh, measure where we're looking for a colour change in an indicator, but we can also look at changes in conductivity that take place in a solution over the course of a titration. Because the idea is that the conductivity of the solution in the conical flask or in the beaker or whatever container the reaction is happening in will change based on the nature of the reactants. So it might the conductivity might increase or it might decrease at a particular rate, um, which depends on whether we're talking about a strong or weak acid or plus a strong or weak base. Um, those particular combinations we'll explore as we go through this video, but it then means that that how that conductivity will will change is something that we um, that is context specific. But we can then use that to create a conductivity curve during the titration. That is, we can actually plot um, in real time or, or after the fact conductivity of the solution versus the volume of the reactant that's been added from the burette. Because we've started with a particular reactant in the, the conical flask or the beaker at the base, and then as we've added more of that reactant, that we will observe changes in conductivity over time. And so then um, there will also be sudden changes of conductivity at the equivalence point, which we can then look for, especially if we're plotting this in real time. So that's what allows us to then be able to determine the equivalence point, um, and when we look at the data afterwards, or we look at the graph afterwards, and then make our determinations from there. And so then, how does the conductivity at the equivalence point then um, you know, what, what does that mean, and why uh, is it, are we able to actually detect something meaningful there? So I want you to have a little look here at this, this particular straight up and down titration um, example, HCl plus NaOH. Now if we take the time to then separate out all of the ions that are present as like a complete or full ionic equation, we can see um, this particular combination. So we've got hydronium ions and chloride ions from the acid sodium and hydroxide ions from the base, and as that reaction takes place, that these are the products. We have a sodium ion and a chloride ion and then a water molecule. So you notice that we don't have hydronium or hydroxide ions anymore. This, this equation is not actually balanced, I've just realised I made a typo, there should be a 2 there. But either way, that we've taken two um, ions and combined them to make two molecules. The sodium and the chloride ions are spectator ions, but it's important for us to be able to recognise that they're there at this stage, because they are actually present in the container. So at the equivalence point, we've reached that very particular point where every H 
3O plus and how OH minus ion have reacted together. We have complete neutralization. We haven't added a single extra ion of in excess. We've just hit that particular point. That means that at that stage that only sodium ions, chloride ions, and water molecules are present in the solution. That is essentially we have a salt or sodium chloride solution. But that means that because there are ions still present, that that solution can conduct electricity. So conductivity doesn't drop to zero at the equivalence point of titration, but rather at the equivalence point that we will have a, a particular value of conductivity that relates to only what would be present once everything's neutralized. So it's important for us to recognize that um, so that even though we know that conductivity will change at the equivalence point, that we should expect it not to be zero. So now we're going to look at the four particular combinations of acid and base, so strong acid and strong base, or weak acid, weak base, those sorts of combinations to see what the curves look like. So let's look at strong and strong. So the same example that we picked up just before with a net ionic equation of this. So first of all, our conductivity starts high. Hydronium ions are, are very have a high conductivity based on their size, based on their charge and their mobility, and so the conductivity is initially very high when we just have acid. As we start to add hydroxide ions, then some of those hydronium ions are neutralized, and so that then they're not in solution anymore. We've added sodium ions from the, um, from the sodium hydroxide, but they're less conductive. So overall, that conductivity starts to drop as more sodium hydroxide gets added. Eventually, we get to the equivalence point. As you can see, this value is not zero. And at that point, we have our sodium chloride solution. Once we've passed that point, um, we're starting to add excess hydroxide ions, which are more conductive. And so then the conductivity starts to increase again the further past the equivalence point we are. So we can see this kind of sharp V shape um, with the minimum conductivity at the equivalence point. What about if we do a weak acid with a strong base? You can see we have a very different shape here. Okay, so rather than a V, that we actually have uh, two stages of increase. So talking about acetic acid plus sodium hydroxide, making sodium acetate and water with our net ionic equation here. So initially we have low, uh, a low conductivity because the acetic acid in the, the conical flask has only dissociated to a very small extent. There's not a lot of hydronium ions naturally present in that container. But then as we, um, as we add sodium hydroxide and this reaction takes place, we're turning the undissociated um, sodium, uh, sorry, um, acetic acid molecules into acetate ions, and sodium ions are added as well. So overall, even though our conductivity is still not very high, it is increasing over time as more and more sodium hydroxide is added and this reaction keeps going. We get to the equivalence point, and then beyond that, what we're adding in hydroxide ions is excess. So our conductivity starts to increase at a steeper slope. You can see the change in the slope here. Um, that conductivity is increasing faster because of the hydroxide ions being added. What about if we have a strong acid and a weak base, such as ammonia and hydrochloric acid here? Okay, so we can see our two equations here. So we start again with a high initial conductivity because of the high concentration of hydronium. As we add ammonia, that then that H3O plus is neutralized, and we're making ammonium ions which are less conductive. So overall, our conductivity drops. We get to a point where we've reached our equivalence point. But after that, rather than rising again, because ammonia is the excess that we're adding, rather than a hydroxide um, strong base, that our conductivity actually stays horizontal. That is, because the ammonia only dissociates to a very, very small extent. So the, the more ammonia we add, we're not changing the ion concentration in solution very much at all. And so the conductivity would stay horizontal or very, very close to it. Well, what about the combination we don't usually do in a titration? That is, a weak acid and a weak base. Well, knowing the conductivity means that this sort of a titration actually becomes a bit more feasible in a way that it isn't with pH monitoring um, because of the too gradual sort of change in pH around the equivalence point. Okay, so let's say we've got this reaction with acetic acid and ammonia. Now, both equations are the same here because we're reacting between um, neutral molecules rather than dissociating ionic compounds. So we start with a low initial conductivity because acetic acid only dissociates to a small extent. But as we start to add ammonia, we're forming two new ions, forming more acetate ions and more ammonium ions. And so the conductivity increases quite quickly or quite um, at, at a, with a, a steep slope. 
we get to a point when we've reached that equivalence point, but then because all we're adding is excess ammonia, which only slightly dissociates, that then our conductivity plateaus. We've reached a horizontal point once again. So you can see that depending on whether we've got a weak acid or a strong acid, weak base or strong base, we get a different type of conductivity curve that we would observe. So let's have a look at them just kind of mapped out here together. So you can see the acids, strong and weak, the bases, strong and weak, just to, to identify those different shapes that we might expect based on a particular reaction. Okay, so we looked at the concept of conductivity. We've seen how conductivity has relevance and, and um, usefulness in titrations to help us determine the equivalence point. We looked at what the nature of the conductivity, the equivalence point comes from, and the fact that it's not zero. And then we looked at the four different types of conductivity curves based on whether we've got strong or weak acids and bases combining in our titration. All right, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.